Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar Ayes Academy for the date 14th of August 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles we will be discussing today. Now let us start our discussion. Let us start our discussion with this FAQ article. This article talks about the coastal ecosystem norms. See, a report was made by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India. This report contains the observation of an audit named Conservation of the Coastal Ecosystem from 2015 to 2020. This is a performance audit. Here, it evaluated the performance of the Union Environment Ministry's steps to conserve the India's coastal ecosystems. Okay, this is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us learn about the important conservation measure taken by the Union Environment Ministry, which is the Coastal Regulation Zone Notification 2019. And along with this, let us know why this coastal regulation zoning is needed. Then let us see some of the advantages and disadvantages associated with the Coastal Regulation Zone Notification 2019. Then we will see the issues with the Coastal Regulation Zone. Okay, this is the plan for today. But before getting into the discussion, let me give you the syllabus of mains and prelims which are relevant to this topic. In preliminary examination, the topic we are going to discuss will come under the general issues of environmental ecology, biodiversity and climate change. Okay, then when you take the mains examination, it comes under the general studies paper 3. To be specific, it comes under biodiversity and environment. And to be more specific, see this line in GS paper 3, which talks about conservation, environmental pollution and degradation, environmental impact assessment. This is where coastal regulation zone comes. So, the topic we are about to discuss is very relevant for your examination. Okay, now let us start our discussion. First, what is a coastal regulation zone? See, India has a coastline of 7516.6 kilometers, which are rich in biodiversity and supports the livelihood of farmers. So, conservation and protection of the coastal environment becomes an important task. For this purpose, in 1991, the Union Ministry of Environment notified the coastal regulation zone notification. So, what the notification does is, it declares certain coastal structures as coastal regulation zone. This is done under the Section 3 of Environmental Protection Act 1986. So, in simple words, coastal regulation zone is a protected area near the coastline. See, here is a potential for a prelims question. They may ask whether coastal regulation zone notification has a statutory backing. Here the answer is true. Yes. Coastal Regulation Zone notification has a statutory backing because this notification is done under Section 3 of Environment Protection Act 1986. Now moving on. Note that the 1991 notification was revised in 2011 and it was amended from time to time. The recent amendment was made by the 2019 notification based on the recommendation of Dr. Shailesh Nayak Committee Report 2015. Okay, see, the Coastal Regulation Zone 2019 notification classifies the coastal areas into different zones. This is done to manage infrastructural activities and regulate them. Okay, see, the Coastal Regulation Zone area is based on high tide line and low tide line. Before getting into the zones, we have to know some basics like what is high tide line and low tide line. Just have a look at this image. See, high tide line means line on the land on which the highest water line reaches during springtime and low tide means the line on the land on which the lowest water line reaches during springtime. Okay, here you may have a question, what is springtime? See, springtime occurs when the sun, moon and earth are in the straight line. During springtime, the highest high tide will reach in these two areas and the lowest low tide will reach in these two areas. See, springtime occurs twice a month once on the full moon day and other time on the new moon day. Okay, now coming back. 
See, regarding each and every coastal regulation zone, we had seen in detail in our Hindu news analysis dated 17th March 2022. So, if you want to know the details about each and every zone, watch this video. I have attached the link here. And I have also attached the link for the video in the description. And I have also commented and pinned the comment. See, my advice is, before seeing this video, just go to this link and revise about the coastal zonation because only after the revision this discussion will give you the maximum benefit okay now i hope you have gone back to the video and revised about the coastal regulation zonation now in our discussion let us focus on the coastal regulation zone notification 2019 first let us see its objective the first objective of this notification is to promote sustainable development here, sustainable development is based on scientific principles and it should also take into account natural hazards such as increasing sea level due to global warming. Okay. The second objective is to give livelihood security to the fisher communities and other local communities in the coastal areas. Besides all these, its main objective is to conserve and protect the environment of coastal structures and marine areas of India. Okay. These are the two main objectives of Coastal Regulation Zone Notification 2019. Now let us see how the Coastal Regulation Zone is implemented. It is implemented through three institutions. Who are they? They are the National Coastal Zone Management Authority which is at the centre. Then the State or Union Territory Coastal Zone Management Authorities in every coastal state and union territories. And finally at the district level we have the district level committees okay these three are the bodies who implement the coastal regulation zone notification okay but what do they specifically do see these bodies examine if the coastal regulation zone clearance granted by the government are per procedure then they examine if the project developers are complying with the conditions after getting the clearance then they examine if the project development objectives under the integrated coastal zone management program are successful. Then they also evaluate the steps taken by the government towards achieving the target under sustainable development goals. Now let us discuss some of the important features of the coastal regulation zone notification 2019. Firstly, it introduces two separate categories for coastal regulation zone 3 that is rural areas. The first category is Coastal Regulation Zone 3A. The A category of Coastal Regulation Zone 3 areas are densely populated rural areas with a population density of 2161 per square kilometer as per the 2011 census. Such areas have a no development zone of 50 meter from the high tide line. See, in the 2011 notification, it was 200 meters from the high tide line. So, in the 2019 notification, what the government did is, they have reduced the area for no development zone. Here you may have a doubt, what is a no development zone? See, no development zone is the area where no construction activities should be carried out. So, between 2011 and 2019, the area where no construction activities should be carried out has been reduced from 200 meters to 50 meters. Okay, this is regarding coastal regulation zone 3 a. Now take the second category which is Coastal Regulation Zone 3B. The B category of Coastal Regulation Zone 3 are rural areas which have population density below 2161 per square kilometer. This is as per 2011 census. See these areas they have no development zone of 200 meter from the high tide line. Okay. So for A category they have no development zone of 50 meter and for B category, they have no development zone of 200 meter. Now moving on, the second important feature of the Coastal Regulation Zone 2019 notification is the Floor Space Index norms. What is known as Floor Space Index? See, it is the ratio between total area of the floors built in a plot and the total area of the plot. See, I hope by looking at this image, you get an idea. Okay. See, this floor space index was eased in the 2019 notification. As per Coastal Regulation Zone 2011 notification, 
the floor space index or floor area ratio had been frozen. But as per the 2019 notification, the government decided to defreeze the floor space index and permit floor space index for construction projects. Okay, this is the second important feature. The next feature is permitting tourism infrastructure in coastal areas. See the 2019 notification permits temporary tourism facilities like toilet blocks, changing rooms, drinking water facilities etc. in beaches. Moving on, the next important feature is the procedure for coastal regulation zone clearance. See, the 2019 notification actually streamlined the clearance process. After 2019, only such projects which are located in coastal regulation zone 1. These are nothing but ecologically sensitive areas. So, project located in coastal regulation zone 1 and projects located in coastal regulation zone 4. Coastal regulation zone 4 covers the area between low tide line and 12 nautical miles seaward. So, both these areas, coastal regulation zone 1 and coastal regulation zone 4, if there is any projects in these areas, clearance for these projects must come from the union ministry. For all other projects, that is projects in coastal regulation zone 2 and coastal regulation zone 3 must be delegated at the state level. So, basically, the 2019 notification streamlined the coastal regulation zone clearance process. The next feature is the marking of no development zone of 20 meters for all islands. The clarification given by the government in this regard is that the islands have space limitation and the geography is unique. So, they have reduced the no development zone in islands for just 20 meters. Okay. The next important feature is regarding pollution abatement. See, to address pollution in coastal areas, the treatment facilities have been made permissible in coastal regulation zone 1B and they are subjected to necessary safeguards. The last important feature is critically vulnerable coastal areas. See, Sundarban regions of West Bengal and other ecologically sensitive areas which are identified under Environment Protection Act 1986 such as Gulf of Kambat and Gulf of Kutch in Gujarat, Achara Natnagiri in Maharashtra, Karwar and Kundapur in Karnataka, Vembanad in Kerala, Gulf of Mannar in Tamil Nadu, Pitarkannika in Odisha and Krishna in Andhra Pradesh are treated as critically vulnerable coastal areas. These critically vulnerable coastal areas will be managed with the involvement of coastal communities including fishermen folks. So, these are the important features of the Coastal Regulation Zone Notification 2019. Having seen about the Coastal Regulation Zone 2019 notification, a question arises. Why is Coastal Regulation Zoning actually needed? Firstly, it is required to protect the ecologically sensitive areas like mangroves, coral reefs, etc. Because these act as shield against natural disasters like tsunami and cyclone. Also note that coastal regulation zone is a resilient measure for mitigating impacts of climate change and high intensity cyclones. This is the first point. The second point is coastal regulation zoning is required to improve the lives of coastal communities like fishing community. And the last important point is coastal regulation zoning is required to balance development with the conservation of coastal ecosystem. So, these are the main points which necessitates the need for coastal regulation zoning. Okay. Having seen this, now let us see the advantages and disadvantages of the 2019 coastal regulation zone notification. Let us start with advantages. See, it helps in economic growth. How? The proposed coastal regulation zone notification 2019 will lead enhanced activities in coastal areas because we already saw the no development zone in islands is reduced to 20 meters from high tide line and in case of coastal regulation zone 3A of high density rural areas, the no development zone has been reduced from 200 meters to 50 meters. See, all these changes made by the notification will promote economic growth and it also conserves the coastal areas. So, development and conservation will go hand in hand. The next advantage is it boosts tourism and employment. See, the 2019 notification allowed for setting up of tourism related infrastructure in beaches. 
this will give a huge boost to tourism and in turn tourism would generate employment activity in the service sector okay all these will add valuable foreign exchange to india okay the third important advantage is it will boost conservation efforts the 2019 notification is expected to rejuvenate the coastal areas while reducing the vulnerabilities of the coastal communities okay the last important advantage is the 2019 notification will boost housing in the coastal areas see as we already saw one of the important feature of the coastal regulation zone notification 2019 is it defreezes floor space index norms so what does this result in it will result in the creation of additional housing along the coast okay and this will be mostly in the form of affordable housing so the crunch in the housing sector will be addressed so these are the main advantages of coastal regulation zone 2019 having seen the advantage now let us see the disadvantages associated with this see this notification has simplified the procedure for environmental clearance so it will open up the fragile intertidal areas to real estate agents so it will further degrade the already fragile coastal ecosystem the next advantage is that while framing this notification the important stakeholders that is the fishermen were not taken into consideration so this is the second main disadvantage see if we look at both these disadvantage both are generic point see in our examination how the question will come is they will ask us to critically analyze the coastal regulation zone notification 2019 so when there is a keyword like critically analyze what you have to do is we have to talk about the advantage and disadvantage associated with the notification see in disadvantage if you write generic points like this you won't fetch more marks so this is where this news article comes in this news article highlights the major issues with the 2019 notification with hard data so while criticizing in your answer instead of writing generic points if you write a point and substantiate it with data your answer will appear more legitimate in the eyes of the evaluator okay so here let us see the issues in the coastal regulations on notification 2019 which is highlighted in the news article firstly the environment ministry had in notified national coastal zone management authority as a permanent body and it has been reconstituted every few years so in the absence of a defined membership it is functioning as a ad hoc body this is the first issue with the coastal regulation zone notification 2019 there is a fault in the implementation stage by the government the second issue is about the absence of members of the expert appraisal committee during certain project deliberations see expert appraisal committee is a committee of scientific experts and senior bureaucrats their work is to evaluate the feasibility of an infrastructure project and its environmental consequences so since there is lack of members in the expert appraisal committee proper feasibility report of infrastructure project is not carried out okay the third issue is improper constitution and functioning of state coastal zone management authority and district level committees okay for example there was delay in the reconstitution of state coastal zone management authority in the states of goa odisha and west bengal then there is the instance of projects being approved despite inadequacies in environmental impact assessment reports the next issue that is highlighted in the cag audit is that certain states do not have a strategy for conservation of coastal zone for example tamil nadu did not have a clear strategy to conserve gulf of manar in addition to this in case of goa there was no system for monitoring coral reefs and no management plan for conserving turtle nesting sites then in few states there was no website to disseminate information related to national coastal zone management authority this is a clear violation of the mandated requirement of the authority so these are the issues with the coastal regulation zone notification 2019 see in this discussion we covered every aspect of the coastal regulation zone we first saw what is coastal regulation zone then we saw what is the need for coastal regulation zone then i provided the link to the hindu news analysis discussion where we discussed about the various zones 
then in this discussion we focus on the important features of the coastal regulation zone notification 2019 then we saw the advantages and issues with the 2019 notification so i hope i covered every aspect of this and i think it will be helpful for your mains preparation okay now with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this article see it has been 5 years since the famous shaira banu versus union of india case but still according to the articles the talaq petitioners live as half divorces so what does half divorces here mean see these women they are still technically married but practically divorced see after the supreme court judgment the instant triple talaq was invalidated so technically these women are still married but their husbands they have moved on they are not providing proper alimony and they have even remarried so though technically they are married practically they are divorced so this is about the news article so in this context let us revise about the shaira banu case and the muslim women protection of rights on marriage act 2019 first what is talaq talaq is an islamic word for divorce it denotes dissolution of marriage in which a muslim man can terminate all marital ties with his wife under the muslim law triple talaq means liberty from the relationship of marriage eventually or immediately here the man by simply pronouncing the word talaq 3 times ends his marriage so simply by telling talaq 3 times a man can give divorce to his wife this instant divorce is called triple talaq also known as talaq e bidat the muslim personal law sharia application act of 1937 has legalized and allowed the practice of triple talaq in india this gave muslim husbands special privilege over his wife and as you know privilege exists to be exploited so this is why there are many cases that we see in news where husbands have given talaq through phone sms email or even social media messages so this is a background for triple talaq now let us move on to the shaira banu case shaira banu a woman from uttarakhand suffered mental and physical torture by her husband in her marital life this is due to the fact that she was not able to fulfill the dowry demanded by their in-laws okay so her husband granted triple talaq through a letter this ended their 14 year marriage her husband also denied her the custody of her two children Shaira Banu challenged this practice before the Supreme Court on the ground that the triple talaq practice is discriminatory and against the dignity of women. The Supreme Court also felt the same. So, the Supreme Court said that triple talaq is unfair because in this form of divorce the Muslim husband dissolves the marriage unjustly without any attempt to reconcile. So, in 2017 the supreme court declared instant triple talaq as unconstitutional as it violates article 14 of the indian constitution even after this the practice still continued this created a situation to make a law for effective implementation of the shaira banu judgment of supreme court so to give immediate effect to the verdict of supreme court the muslim women protection of rights on marriage ordinance 2018 was promulgated and after that just to keep the order active two more ordinances were promulgated and finally after the assent of the president the muslim women protection of rights on marriage act 2019 came into force so in this discussion we shall also see three important provisions of this muslim women protection of rights on marriage act 2019 the first is the act declared instant divorce granted by pronunciation of talaq three times as void and illegal that is this act made the instant triple talaq a criminal offense and provides for jail term of 3 years for the muslim man who commits the crime secondly the act made triple talaq a cognizable and non bailable offense here cognizable is the offense is a serious offense and in case of cognizable offense the police can arrest without a warrant and since this is a non bailable offense here bail is not granted as a right So this is the second important provision. Moving on, in case triple talaq is pronounced, the Muslim woman upon whom talaq was pronounced is also granted custody of the children. This act also mandates the husband to pay allowance or alimony to the wife. So these are the three main provisions of the Muslim woman protection of rights on Marriage Act 2019. 
See, this act provided legal protection for the Muslim women against the irrational pronouncement of triple talaq. So, that's all for this discussion. See, in this discussion, we revised about the Shaira Banu case 2017 and the major provisions of the Muslim Women Protection of Rights and Marriage Act 2019. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this FAQ article. This article is about the Langya virus or Lay V. See, we already covered this topic in detail on the 12th August 2022 Hindu News Analysis. So, what I am going to do today is, I am going to revise the major points about this virus in a fast manner. After that, I am going to compare this virus and the Nipah virus. See, this is because both Langya virus and Nipah virus comes under the Henipa virus family. Okay. So, let us start with the Langya virus. As the name says, this disease is caused by the Langya virus. Where did this virus originate? Langya virus originated in the Shandong province in China. Okay. Now, what is the zoonotic reservoir of this virus? See, this virus is mainly found in the shrews. Shrews are nothing but a rat-like rodent. Okay. Now, what are the symptoms of this disease? The symptoms include fever, fatigue, cough, anorexia, myalgia, nausea, headache, vomiting, low platelet count and low WBC count. Okay. Here, myalgia means muscle pain and anorexia means it is an eating disorder where people have unwarranted fear of being overweight. So, they do not eat much and maintain below normal body weight. And another point about Langya virus is that since it is zoonotic in origin, there is a definite incident of animal to human transmission. But the human to human transmission is not fully established. Okay. Now, moving on to Nipah virus. First, let us see the similarities between the Langya virus and the Nipah virus. As I already said, both Langya virus and Nipah virus comes under the Henipah virus family. This is the first similarity. The second similarity is regarding the genetic structure. Both Langya virus and Nipah virus have negative strain RNA as its genetic material. Okay, this is the second similarity. And the third similarity is both these are zoonotic in origin and there is a definite evidence of animal to human transmission. Okay, so these are the three main similarities between Nipah virus and Langya virus. Now let us take Nipah virus and discuss some of its specifics. See, we saw Langya virus originated in Langya district in China. Likewise, Nipah virus first broke out in Malaysia in 1998 and Singapore in 1999. We saw shrews are the reservoir of Langya virus. In case of Nipah virus, the reservoirs are fruit bats. Okay. And finally, we saw that there is a evidence of animal to human transmission in Langya virus, but human to human transmission is not established. But in case of Nipah virus, both animal to human transmission and human to human transmission are established. Okay. See, the main symptoms of Nipah virus include acute encephalitis and respiratory illness. So, that's all regarding this discussion. See, in this discussion, we first saw some of the basic points about Langya virus. Then we compared the similarities and the differences between Langya virus and Nipah virus. And finally, we saw some important points about Nipah virus. See, this is how you have to prepare. Whenever a new zoonotic disease appear, you have to read about it and also revise about the other zoonotic diseases which you come across in the current affairs. Your notes also should be like this. In a specific page, there should be all the zoonotic diseases that appeared in news. See, this will help you revise faster and help you to retain information in a simple manner. It will also help you to compare one disease with other. Okay, so hope this was helpful. Now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. See this news article here. See, Kerala government recently decided to revise the framework for its school curriculum. And this move of Kerala government is not taken up well by the Muslim organization of the state. There is a conflict here. The conflict is because Kerala government decided to include topics such as gender neutrality and gender justice as a part of school curriculum. And this move of the Kerala government is not taken up well by the Muslim organization. See, we are a democratic country and freedom of religion is part of our fundamental rights. So, the Muslim organizations claim that lifestyle and religious convictions are personal choices. 
so state should not use educational institutions to impose their liberal ideas among the school children so this is the news article here but why is this related to our examination see there is no relevance for our examination here but news articles like this can be asked as a case study in your ethics paper see they may say that you are a education secretary who is asked to frame the school curriculum for the state and after you frame the curriculum there is a conflict in the state the conflict is because muslim organizations are opposing your curriculum because it is trying to impart liberal ideas like gender equality gender justice and gender neutrality so this is how the case study will be framed and after the case study questions like these will be asked let me read out the question the first question is what are the mindset issues and the ethical dilemmas in the above case and the second question is as a education secretary how will you handle the situation and what will be your course of action so take this as a practice question try to approach a question this is very simple there is no correct answer here just think about the case that i mentioned and try to find the ethical dilemmas in the case and also find the conflicting mindset in the case okay this will answer the first question and in the second question you have to write your own opinion you have to write how you will handle the situation and what will be your course of action after writing that you have to substantiate that is you have to explain why you chose such a course of action to address this issue so take this as a practice question and post your answers in the comment section so let us conclude this and take up the next news article have a look at this news article this news article talks about parsis who are these parsis see parsis are a zoroastrian community they came to gujarat from iran following its conquest by arab muslims in the 7th century the immigrants were granted permission to stay by the local ruler but there were two conditions one is they should adopt local language that is gujarati and the other one is their women should adopt the local dress that is the sari okay so the parsis they settled in udvada navrasi daman valsat surat and mumbai the holy place for the parsis is the fire temple and the coastal town of udvada is home to the most sacred of the zoroastrian fire temple another important feature about the parsi community is after death they do not bury or burn the bodies instead they leave the dead ones in the open area and let the body be feasted by vultures so these are some of the features of the parsi community so since tomorrow is the independence day for india let us see some of the parsi community members who played active role in india's struggle for independence so in this discussion let us focus on two parsi freedom fighters they are dada bhai navroji and parosha mekta let us first start with dada bhai navroji he is also called as the grand old man of india in 1851 he founded a fortnightly called raft gafter meaning truth teller it is a gujarati fortnightly with a persian name it was a progressive journal educating the readers on duties of citizenship he was an active member of the bombay association note that this is the first association in western india to consider political issues see he was the first indian to be elected to the house of commons and he is famous for his theory that is called the drain of wealth theory according to drain of wealth theory the british robbed india of its wealth to make themselves rich and this theory was the cornerstone of india's argument against british rule there are two features that make his career to stand out prominently one is the sustained advocacy of india's cause abroad he did this through an organization called east india association see east india association was started by dada bhai navroji in 1867 it was a political advocacy group for india having both britishers and indians on its membership roll it was the first political organization with memberships from different provinces of india east india association functioned actively in london okay the other feature is the use of statistics to shape public discourse see his statistics were based on parliamentary returns of indian accounts so these are the two features that makes his career stand out okay 
Now let us see some more data about his political life. As I already said, he was the first Indian to be elected to the House of Commons. He was Congress president thrice, that is in 1886, 1893 and 1906. This 1906 Congress session was held in Calcutta. As I already said, it was held under the leadership of Dada Bhai Navaroji. And during this session, Swaraj was accepted as the goal of Indian people. Okay. So these are some of the important points about Dada Bhai Navaroji. Now let us move on to Ferosha Mehta. Ferosha Mehta is from Bombay. He is called as the father of municipal government in Bombay. This is because for the need of municipal government reforms, he drew up the Municipal Act of 1872. He later in 1873 became the Municipal Commissioner of Bombay. He presided over the 6th session of Indian National Congress in 1890. and he was knighted in 1904 he is one of the famous moderate leaders regarding a newspaper he published a english newspaper called bombay chronicle and in this newspaper detailed treatment of indians in south africa was published and it also published gandhi's passive resistance movement in south africa so these are some points relating to ferosha mehta that is important for your prelims examination so in this discussion we saw about two towering parsi freedom fighters they are dada bhai navaroji and ferosha mehta so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this news article see recently andhra government decided to build two check dams across the kosasthalaya river so tamil nadu chief minister has decided to write a letter to his andhra pradesh counterpart to condemn this this is because kosasthalaya is considered as the lifeline of chennai So this is the news article in this context let us see some points about the Kosasthalaya river see Kosasthalaya is a 136 km long river which originates near Pallipattu in Tiruvallu district and it drains into bay of bengal its northern tributary nagari originates in chittur district in andhra pradesh and joins the main river in the backwaters of poondi reservoir its catchment area is spread over vellur chittur Tiruvallur and the Chennai district this river branches near Kesavaram Anaikat and this tributary flows through the Chennai city as Kuvam river while the main river flows to the Poondi reservoir from the Poondi reservoir the river flows through Tiruvallur district and enters Chennai metropolitan area and joins the sea at the Ennur creek so basically this is a interstate river and since poondi supplies most of chennai's drinking water this river is considered as the lifeline of chennai okay see the total river basin is 3727 square kilometers of which 877 square kilometer lies in andhra pradesh and the rest in tamil nadu okay so since maximum catchment area rise in tamil nadu and since this river provides drinking water to chennai the tamil nadu chief minister has raised the concern about the construction of check dam so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw some basic points about kosasthalaya river now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article this news article talks about a excavation site in tamil nadu this is nothing but adichanallur this excavation site is a burial site and it is located in the lower valley of the tamarabarni river in present day thootukudi district in southern tamil nadu this site made news today because the archaeological survey of india has found gold in the burial site in this background let us quickly go through some of the important points about adichanallur see another important sangam age site is located near adichanallur it is nothing but kurkai it is located 25 km away from adichanallur It is mentioned in the Sangam literature as a seaport. It was a important town in the Pandian kingdom. But as the time passed, sea has retreated several kilometers and Kurkai is now located inland. Now coming back to Adichanallur. See, Adichanallur is a urn burial site having characteristics of Iron Age. It was first discovered by German explorer Dr. F. Jagorin in 1876. Next to him another excavation was carried out by Alexander Ray okay he found south indian artifacts in this site in 2005 there was another excavation in adichanallur and during this excavation 169 clay urns containing human skeletons were found 
and most of these urns were 3800 years old apart from the skeletons several gold diadems with holes on each end for tying them around the forehead were also found during this excavation there were bronze figurines of buffaloes goats tigers and elephants in this site due to its importance adichennalur is recognized by government as one among the five sites that were to be developed into iconic sites the government also announced the development of museum at these sites so in essence adichennalur is located in southern tamil nadu it is an iron age site to be specific it is a urn burial site so that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions we have four practice prelims questions today let us see them one by one let us take up the first question consider the following statements regarding baikaiji kama first statement baikaiji kama was the first person to hoist indian national flag in a foreign land see this statement is correct because madam baikaiji kama was the first person to hoist the indian flag in a foreign land on 22nd august 1907 She did this during the International Socialist Conference in Stuttgart in Germany and she appealed for equality and autonomy from British which had taken over the Indian subcontinent. Now let us take up the second statement. She founded the Central Bank of India. See this statement is incorrect because Central Bank of India was founded by Feroz Shah Mehta. He played a major role in the process. Okay? Now let us take up the third statement. She was inspired by Dada Bhai Nauroji. See, this statement is correct. Madam Kama met Dada Bhai Nauroji in London and was inspired by his ideals. Due to this inspiration, she plunged into the Indian freedom struggle. So, here statement 1 is correct, statement 2 is incorrect and statement 3 is correct. So, the correct answer is option C, 1 and 3 only. So, with this, let us also see some points about Madam Bhai Kaji Kama. Okay? See, as I already said, she was drawn towards the political issues at the early age. She left India for London and it was in London, Madam Bhai Keji Kama met Dada Bhai Nauroji and she was inspired by his ideals. Okay. She also toured USA where she gave speeches on the ill effects of British rule and urged the Americans to support the cause of India's freedom. Also note that she was an advocate of women's right and universal suffrage. So these are some points about Madam Bhai Kaji Kama. Why I ask this question is, she is also from the Parsi community. So you can go through it. It is important for your prelims examination. Moving on, let us take up the second question. Which among the following is the correct sequence of river from north to south? Here the correct answer is option A, Kosasthalayar, Kuvam, Adayar and Cheyar. See, look at this map. See, from this map itself, you can find the correct answer. Okay. So as a part of this discussion, let us also see some points about the rivers mentioned here kosasthalayar we covered in the discussion itself so let us first take up adayar adayar river originates near chambarambakkam lake in kanchipuram district and it is one of the three rivers which flows through chennai it reaches bay of bengal at the adayar estuary so this is about adayar river moving on to kuvam river kuvam river originates from a village of the same name in tiruvallur district This river almost bisects Chennai while passing through the city and it also finally drains into Bay of Bengal. And finally let us take up the Chayar river. See it is a important seasonal river which runs through the Thiruvannamalai district of the state of Tamil Nadu and it is an important tributary of Palar river. So in this discussion we saw some points about Adayar river, Kuvam river and Chayar river. And the Kusasthalaya river we already covered as a part of the discussion. Okay. So here the correct answer is option A. Moving on to the third question. Among the given sites, which are INH sites? Four sites are given. We have to find which among the four sites are INH sites. The sites given are Dadupur, Malhar, Adichan, Allur and Kosambi. See first a little bit introduction about INH. See INH doesn't have a certain starting point and a ending point. because in most areas of the world iron age started at varying times but the commonality among that iron age is in all the cases iron age started after the collapse of the bronze age take india for example india's iron age emerged at an era of transition known as vedic period lasting from 1500 bce to 600 bce 
the vedic period covers both the end of the bronze age following the collapse of harappan civilization around 1400 bce okay following the collapse of harappan civilization around 1400 bce and the start of the iron age okay so this is about iron age here the correct answer is option a all the four sites given are iron age sites here dadupur is located in lucknow district of uttar pradesh malhar is located in the bilaspur district of chatisgarh and adichanallur it is located in tutukuren district of tamil nadu and finally kosambi is also located in uttar pradesh so once again the correct answer is option a 1 2 3 and 4 let us take up the last prelims question for today see this is a practice prelims question for you two statements are given one statement about cognizable offense and another statement about non bailable offense is given see this we saw in the discussion itself so try to find the correct answer and post it in the comment section so now let us take up the main question for today let me read out the question what are coastal regulation zones analyze the 2019 coastal regulation zone notification see this is a very straight forward question and the first part of the question you have to give a general introduction about coastal regulation zone if you see the video that i mentioned during the discussion you can write the answer for this and after that in the analysis part today's discussion will be very helpful in our discussion today we saw the advantages and the issues with the coastal regulation zone notification so write that as a part of the answer try to write a specific answer do not write a generalistic answer okay this also i discussed during our discussion process so interested aspirants write the answer and post it in the comment section so if you like today's video like comment and share it with your friends for more updates regarding upsc preparation subscribe to shankar is academy youtube channel thank you